Good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here with you at this conference. And I'm particularly grateful for Dan and the organizers for asking me to speak today. Um, my name is Greg Sorensen. I'm a neuroradiologist, as many of you know, and uh, I realize that I'm in a very distinguished group of um, scientists and investigators. And I feel a little bit like uh, bringing coals to Newcastle. And in particular, as you will uh, no doubt see very shortly, I know almost nothing about anything below the neck. Uh, and so this is all sort of foreign territory uh, for me. Um, but um, I have been spending the last five years spending a lot of time thinking about uh, screening in radiology and in the challenges of bringing uh, machine learning tools and artificial intelligence tools and, and automated, uh, um, uh, just quantitative imaging in general uh, to the problem of screening for cancer. And uh, knowing that, I think, is why I'm here today to try to uh, think with you together about some of the challenges we face as a, a radiology community around um, the idea of advancing um, the performance, our performance, um, as we try to deliver care in the screening setting um, and in, in using uh, CT for the lung. But I hope to speak about things that transcend that and particularly identify some of the challenges and the hurdles that we faced. Um, it's a daunting topic, uh, but I think it's one that um, there are some pretty clear now data around, and um, I want to bring these to you uh, in a, I hope, positive and helpful way, and uh, with a lot of respect for the work that, that you and your teams are doing. Uh, I like to, to, to try to frame the question a little bit this way. Uh, Dan asked, you know, what are the challenges and the hurdles, and I would say, uh, what's the uh, one way to address this? I would say is what's the, to ask you. What do you think is the most powerful force, the single most powerful force in, Amer in American uh, medicine today? And uh, my glib answer to that is uh, Newton's first law, which is uh, inertia. There's just a tremendous amount of inertia in American medicine and actually throughout the world of medical practice. And there are some actually uh, very substantial reasons for that. And if you are asking what are the hurdles that you're facing to roll out quantitative tools for image analysis to approve screening, I have to, I, I think, let's think about the inertia we're facing and why we're facing that. Part of that, of course, comes down to resources, revenue, uh, money, however you want to think about it. That, that probably plays a role. But I also think that um, American trained physicians especially are in fact very data driven and very experience driven. Um, uh, just as a quick uh, aside, um, one of my favorite lecturers when I was in medical school was the late Judah Folkman. And uh, he uh, was a very wry character. And he was explaining to us, uh, new medical students, about some of the facts of medicine. And he said one of the most uh, uh, useful um, uh, uh, ways that we describe uh, what we um, try to explain in American medicine is with the phrase, we see this. Uh, essentially, it's our experience. And you, you say, well, you know, why do we give chemotherapy or why does, why does this cancer appear this way? Well, we see this. It's sort of essentially a, a cop out, but it's also a recognition that the wealth of accumulated experience has something to say. And I think um, often physicians' intuition about why something works or doesn't work, why we're not changing is, a, is an important thing to listen to. And some of that is human behavior I think we need to overcome. Uh, some of that is actually uh, well-deserved. And so it's that balance that I hope to share together with you today. Um, let's think specifically about some reasons for inertia, um, or as I might call it specifically, mistrust of these new quantitative tools or concerns about rolling them out. After all, if they were indeed the greatest things since sliced bread, we would all uh, adopt them in no time uh, flat. And of course, we know that's not the case. So based on what we've seen with breast cancer screening, I would offer that there are three ideas that I want you to think about today that I've listed here. And I hope that we can apply them um, uh, universally, but I wanna specifically walk you through the data and why I think these are issues for us um, with lung cancer screening. First is we have to understand our own baseline performance in performing the task. Uh, I like to think about this as nobody wants to take medicine if they don't think they're sick. It's very hard to implement change if people don't think they need to change. And so we need to really be honest with ourselves around where our performance is and where it might uh, be able to be improved medically um, or else we're not going to make any progress. So that's one idea number one. We really need to measure our performance at baseline. Second, uh, when we try to roll out tools, 
uh, we need to be willing to measure and assess whether they're really improving things in the real world. And then third, I think there's quite a bit of variability in the way physicians practice, and we need to recognize that. It's easy to dichotomize doctors or, or humans into, oh, well, he, he or she is good at this or she's bad at that. It's not a good, bad thing frequently. So now let me take each of these ideas and move them a little bit deeper and apply specifically uh, to, to lung cancer screening. And to start off, uh, of course, you all know this far better than I do. Lung cancer screening really works. I was very pleasantly surprised when NLST reported its positive results uh, back in uh, 2011. And uh, it was very caught off guard. I wasn't expecting it. Maybe it was 2010 when we first learned. Um, and of course, this has been replicated now in other studies. I, I want to put this up front because a lot of the, the um, a lot of the pushback that I have seen in trying to bring new tools uh, to physicians in the breast cancer screening community has been interpreted by us, by us radiologists, as somehow an implication that screening doesn't work. And that, our, <clears throat> that when we try to say we can do better, that we're <clears throat> somehow hearing that, we practitioners are somehow hearing that as a threat to the actual practice of screening itself, as if we're saying, Screening shouldn't be done. No, no, that's not the point here. <clears throat> but you'll see it's, it's hard not to see this as the perceived reaction of, of people. And so as you think about how you're going to roll out new tools into your community, let's try to learn from the reactions that we've seen from the breast cancer screening radiology community. And, and I think this is important because humans are involved here. Humans are involved in the interpretation. And in fact, the whole point of quantitative imaging is that we can improve the human interpretation. So we have to measure that and see kind of what that delta is. So let's talk about that a little bit in breast cancer screening. I would say it's pretty clear that there is a certain reluctance amongst the breast cancer imaging community to measure and describe human performance. Perhaps it's concerned that we will be giving our enemies uh, some info, I don't really know, but the data have been clear for decades that there is wide variation in human performance 1994 paper from Joanne Elmore showing a kappa of under 0.5. Um, 2020 paper here just in January from the Google group in, uh, that was looking at AI. And they, of course, did a reader study to measure against humans where they gave six humans uh, a bunch of scans. And you can see their performance, their AUC 0.625, not particularly impressive. Uh, and the AI uh, managed to beat that, which was, of course, important. But the thing I want to draw your attention to is this relatively weak AUC. Many in the breast imaging community, radiology, have said, no, these reader studies, and this is not the first study to show this, many FDA approval studies, numerous rigorously controlled studies have shown that human performance in interpretation against ground truth has this uh, modest AUC. Uh, and there's been a lot of pushback. Uh, one of the few prospectively uh, documented studies is DMIST, published in, back in 2005, and that also showed humans had an AUC of about 0.78. Um, when you actually look at the uh, self-reported literature, though, it's a different story. So, for example, the Breast Cancer Screening Consortium, uh, they report 87% uh, sensitivity, 89% specificity with a very high AUC. This is an AUC of over 0.9. They don't really want to admit that the gap between human performance is so big. When you really push the, the folks who are really studying this carefully, they will admit that there are pretty big gaps in performance. Uh, Dr. Prasano was on a, uh, uh, on a committee at the Institute of Medicine that back in 2015 reported that even in the BCSC consortium data, which is essentially doctors who are willing to have their own data um, analyzed, about half of them did not meet specificity or recall rate guidelines. You know, how frequently are we calling women back? So, and this, these data, you, you know, there, there are good scientists involved in BCSC. I'm not saying uh, that their science isn't solid at one level, but there's a strong gatekeeper bias that's hard to overcome if you don't prospectively um, enroll women. After all, the only biopsy results we get are the women who a doctor thinks should be biopsy. So what if they didn't get a biopsy? What if they move to another state? We have no way of tracking those in the United States. Uh, and of course, when we look at uh, uh, baseline uh, um, incidence rates, it can be hard to match this up. You'll see that the cancer detection rate uh, here in 27, 2007 to 2013 was listed at five 
uh, per thousand. Most of us think that the, uh, the rate is between six and seven per thousand women. Um, and so that would imply a sensitivity and specificity, uh, you know, or a sensitivity at least uh, lower uh, than 87%, probably uh, somewhere in the mid 80s. We, it's hard to know exactly in screening mammograms what the cancer detection rate should be. DMIST, uh, when they followed for 15 months, uh, found 7.8 cancers per thousand. Most women, of course, go 24 months between screens on average, or maybe a little longer. And so you'd think that the cancer detection rate would be even higher. Um, the SEER data suggests it's about four and a half per thousand per year. So again, if it's every two years, you think it would, that we're screening, you think it'd be about nine per thousand. Wherever it is, it, it, that's of course an important thing because if, if you think you're screening every year, well then maybe your cancer defects rate of five is awesome. So there's some controversy about this, but there's also kind of an, a lack of willingness to look at this. So for example, just this month in radiology, there was a, a paper out of Sweden that looked at their screening performance and they reported a sensitivity of 73% and a specificity of 96%. But again, they were only finding three per thousand cancers uh, and when I looked to see why that is, they had created a definition that excluded any cancers found after a year. So essentially two thirds of the cancers, they just didn't even worry about. And so they were only looking, uh, you know, they would only count, they were only using, they were using a much smaller denominator, which made their sensitivity numbers look much better. If you were to include the whole data set, their sensitivity data is more like what we see with DMIST and other st supported studies, which is closer to 50%. So we have to look with a, a critical eye at what we're doing, or we're never gonna be able to uh, uh, um, recognize why we need quantitative tools to improve our performance. So that's point number one. Point number two, when we implement uh, these tools, we need to see if they work. As you know, BreastCAD was uh, approved by the FDA with rigorous studies in 1998. It was reimbursed uh, starting in 2000. Numerous vendors did very uh, uh, compelling FDA clearance studies and got FDA clearance with rigorous science. But that was in a laboratory setting. When we actually brought BreastCAD into the real world, it wasn't used as a second look. People were using it right up front. Uh, they, it wasn't kind of, it was basically used off label. And I think if you were to ask uh, even the designers, they kind of expected some of that behavior. And so in practice, most doctors I talked to when I came into the breast field a few years ago said, oh yeah, I ignore CAD. I, I basically don't even pay attention to it. I, I only use it for medical legal reasons. And in 2015, uh, Connie Lehman and uh, a very distinguished group of investigators, again, using BCSC data, identified that in fact, doctors perform worse with these quantitative tools. Why? It's very hard to know for sure. Maybe they lean too much on them and it was old, quote unquote AI that didn't work all that well. Maybe they were using them as first look when they were designed as second look. We don't really know what went wrong, but both anecdotally, which I think is important, but also now scientifically with this kind of data, the AI tools, the machine learning tools, and, and I, it, just in case uh, you don't remember, in 1998, when uh, uh, R2 got approval, they described their software as based on neural networks. This was a neural network based tool uh, modeled on neural networks. They're an artificial intelligence based tool. So the idea of AI has been around for a long, long time. And uh, definitely, uh, you know, there's nothing new there from a regulatory perspective. And yet when we put this into practice, it didn't actually work the way we all intended. So that's my second point. You have to check the real world. Um, third, let's look back at those curves. Uh, and when we see the humans, and the curve on the left is from that nature paper, the curve on the right is from some work we've done doing reader studies. Uh, uh, either way, you see each of the individual dots below the ROC curves. Uh, and it's on the purple and the nature paper, it's individual dots in our, our research, which will be published soon. Uh, these are the individual readers, but look at the difference on the right between reader number one and reader number four and five. Completely different reading styles. One has a very low callback rate, num reader number one, callback rate probably 5%. Um, and so that's fantastic if you want a low recall rate, but only finds about half the cancers. The uh, person on the right, uh, the readers number four and five, are catching 90-ish, 95% of the cancers, but they're recalling everybody. Uh, which do you want? Well, you know, we're hoping that this trade-off can be made. What does this tell me? it suggests that we don't need one kind of AI. We probably need two kinds of AI, at least, 
because there's different reader styles. We have to figure out how to help. Are the people um, have there? Are they recalling too many people for biopsy, whatever? Or are they missing cancers? Different set of mindsets. We've all known since training that there are people who are overly cautious and there are people who move too fast. If you want to kind of hyperbolize these as readers, why would we think the same AI would be perfect for both, or at least the user interface to the same AI? So in conclusion, I would say, here are some um, recommended priorities for you to consider. Measure performance pre-AI. Take an honest look at it, whether that's under QA protection or whatever you need. It's hard than it, harder than it sounds. In the breast, we have MQSA requirements to measure our performance, and it's still hard to get this data, despite mandates from Congress and resources to go into that. Second, when you start to roll things out in a pilot phase or whatever, please measure. Uh, look and see if it's working the way you expect. Feedback is the breakfast of champions, and you've got to get some feedback on how things are going. Third, recognize that these are humans that you have to interact with, and consider trying to tailor your tools so that you'll boost adoption. Finally, I would just say I am trying to follow my own medicine. Uh, this is some data that from our own um, uh, groups at RadNet. Each one of these dots is a different doctor. Um, and you can see along the x-axis, I plotted their recall rate, and on the y-axis, their cancer detection rate. Um, here in light yellow is the IOM recommended range. So the doctors whose, uh, uh, whose uh, dots fall in this recommended range, these are the people who follow the guidelines. You can see we have a ton of physicians, we have the two or three, two, more than 200 doctors that we're studying here who don't follow the guidelines. I can tell you I've met this doctor, she's amazing. She has a very low recall rate, 4%, very high cancer detection rate, over 7%. That's who I want reading my wife's mammograms, I can tell you, uh, because you know, she, it, the reason that this uh, recall rate is set um, you know, as kind of low as it is, is because you don't want to call few, too few women back at the risk of lowering your CDR. This doctor, she happens to be just really good, but, but for the most part, that, these outliers you do wonder about. Uh, like for example, this, this person over here, recall rate, 25% with a cancer detection rate of four. What's really going on here? Uh, so we are trying to do this internally. It's not easy to get this data. Uh, we recognize it's gonna teach us that we're gonna have to have different approaches for different kinds of doctors. Where does this go? Where do we go from here? Again, it's a challenging problem, but I think these are the challenges that I would bring to you. So in conclusion, quality and cost considerations strongly advise that as we move screening into the clinic, which we all know it works, that's, this is not an attack on screening, but as we bring AI to try to make it better and faster, of course, cost and quality are super important, but there are some real human barriers and there are real sort of implementation barriers. I've listed again my three priorities, I won't go over them again, but I just uh, look forward to the conversation with you. Thanks very much for your attention. I look forward to the Q&A.